The Word of God, the Holy Bible, is a treasure and a gift beyond compare. Every passage of it points to a marvelous truth that God's love for man impelled him to step out of eternity and unite with his creation in order to redeem him from sin. Jesus Christ is both the author and subject of this precious word. Join us at the Superior Word each week as we search out this wonderful gift in search of Christ Jesus. Okay, we're going to read Isaiah 52, starting in the 13th verse, instead of a psalm today, and that way we can understand why this child of Christmas came and what his mission was. It says here, Behold, my servant shall deal prudently. He shall be exalted and extolled and be very high. Just as many were astonished at you, so his visage was marred more than any man, and his form more than the sons of men. So he shall sprinkle many nations. Kings shall shut their mouths at him. For what had not been told them, they shall see. And what they had not heard, they shall consider. Starting in the 53rd chapter, who has believed our report? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant and as a root out of dry ground. He has no form or comeliness. And when we see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. He is despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we did not esteem him. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray, we have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He was led as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before its shearers is silent, so he opened not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment. And who shall, who will declare his generation? For he was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgressions of my people, he was stricken. And they made his grave with the wicked, but with the rich at his death, because he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He has put him to grief. When you shall make his soul an offering for sin. He shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see the labor of his soul and be satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteous servant shall justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out his soul unto death, and he was numbered with the transgressors. And he bore the sin of many, and he made intercession for the transgressors. The mission of Christ. Today we're going to have a sermon out of Matthew chapter 1. I'm going to read you the main verse and then a couple others so we have the context. This is Matthew 1, verses 18 through 21. Now the birth of Jesus Christ was as follows. After his mother Mary was betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Spirit. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man and not wanting to make her a public example, was minded to put her away secretly. But while he thought about these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take to you Mary, your wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit, and she will bring forth a son and you shall call his name Jesus. As we celebrate this day, just as we do each year, let us remember that it is not a day which is found on myths or superstitions. It may have devolved into that for most of the world, but that was never its original intent. It has become common for people to find fault in all the associated things that we do at Christmas time. We put up pine trees and someone finds fault in the symbolism. We hang up ornaments and someone else finds fault in us doing so. Even the word Christmas is there for people to find fault in. And it is true that we should never let these customs and these traditions obscure our vision of what this day actually symbolizes. 
but even the fault finders are to be found at fault over that. The day has real significance, and it, has, it is of the greatest importance. And so whether traditionalist or fault finder, most of us have never understood the true connection to the meaning of the 25th of December. It is, in fact, the day that Christ was born, but not in the sense that most people understand. People in Korea would, but for most of the rest of the world, there is little comprehension of the day's meaning. You see, Korean people reckon the span of their lives differently than we do. When you ask how old they are, they will tell you an answer to the age that is different than that which we are used to. I was born on 18 August of 1964, and so I would be, as of today, 52 years, 4 months, and a couple of days old. But a Korean will tell you that they are 53 years old. And the reason for this is that they reckon life from conception, not birth out of the womb. To the liberal left in the Western world, that thought would be utterly scandalous. How can you justify killing someone in the womb if their life had actually begun? The horror of the thought for them would certainly drive their bloodthirsty minds to madness. But this is when life begins, whether the left likes it or not. The Koreans got it right. It is a moment to celebrate and to cherish. It is a time of light and happiness. It is the beginning of the time of our lives. Our text verse for today comes from Isaiah 7. It is the 14th verse. Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. 700 years before the coming of Christ, Isaiah said that something unimaginable would occur. A virgin would conceive and bear a son. The two things are separate and yet complementary events. First, she would conceive, and then she would have a son. One logically follows after the other. But in the normal course of events, the first would be impossible. A virgin simply cannot get pregnant. People argue over the Hebrew word that Isaiah used, which we translate as virgin, claiming that it doesn't necessarily have to mean virgin. However, the context necessarily demands it. The Greek translation of the Old Testament supports that fact, and Matthew's use of a word which can only mean virgin settles it. The virgin would become pregnant, and the child would be called Emmanuel, God with us. The verse itself tells us when life begins. It is not as the child leaves the womb, but when the womb is impregnated. The word virgin explains the matter. As Isaiah wrote, he may or may not have had any idea what he was writing. But if he did, his mind surely went back to the very first pages of the Bible where a promised deliverer would come who was the seed of the woman. When speaking of genealogies, it is always the seed of man which is referred to in the Bible. But in Genesis chapter 3, the seed of the woman is mentioned. Whether Isaiah realized the importance of the words that he penned or not, we can and we should realize them. We who have the whole story penned out for us can see the whole picture. It is a picture clearly revealed in his superior word. And so let's turn to that precious word once again. And may God speak to us through his word today. And may his glorious name ever be praised. I have two very short thoughts for you today. The first is the spark of life. Much has been said both of the deity and the humanity of Jesus Christ on both sides of the debate. There are those who believe that he is fully God and fully man. There are those who believe he is a man, but he is not God. There are those who believe he is not God and that even his manhood is just a made-up fable. In other words, he never existed. And then there are those who just don't care. And within these views, there are more divisions. He was both a man and God for a spell, but now he's only God. He became God after being only a man. And so on and on the arguments go. And yet, if we take the Bible simply and at face value, even from the few words of the one verse which comprises the sermon's title, we can really come to only one conclusion about who this man is. Matthew 1.18 says, Hirite angastri ekusa eknumatos agio. She was discovered in womb holding from Holy Spirit. Two things must be admitted here from a simple reading of the Bible. One is that Mary is a human, 
and this child is the product of her womb, and thus this child is a human being. The second is that the Holy Spirit is not a human. If one accepts the obvious interpretation of Scripture, which shows that the Holy Spirit is God, then the child is the product of God. There is no human father, and it is the seed of the father that determines lineage in the Bible. Thus, this child is deity. He is the Son of God. Of course, there are those who will do anything possible to diminish the deity of the Holy Spirit, because by doing so, they can then tear apart the central message of the Bible. However, this stupidly argued premise is for a debate which is unnecessary here. The Holy Spirit in both testaments of the Bible is clearly defined as God and is easily defended as such, and so we'll overlook that as unnecessary here. What we have in these few words here, which are so quickly passed over by our eyes and our minds, is a description of the most incredible occurrence which has ever come to pass in all of time, not just in human history, but in all of time itself. The very creation of the universe pales in comparison to what is described by the words Hiruti and Gastri Ekhusa Ek Numatos Agio. She was found with child through the Holy Spirit. When God created, he created not out of himself, ex Deo, or out of God. God is spirit and is not limited to that which is created. Rather, when he created, it was ex nihilo, or out of nothing. The Psalms say, for he spoke and it was done. He commanded and it stood fast. There was nothing, no time, no space, no matter, only God. And by the power of the spoken word, there was then something. Time began, matter stood firm, and space filled the void, both around matter and within it. Everything that we see, even to the farthest reaches of the universe, came into existence at one moment. It is an incredible thing to contemplate, but it was of far less moment than the enormity of what occurred in the womb of Mary. In a flash as brief as the utterance of the word of creation itself, life, the true life of all things, sprung into existence in her womb. And yet, it was life that already existed, even before the creation of our physical realm. What a paradox! And yet, what an event of the greatest marvel of all. God had united with his creation in that blessed womb. Christ had come. Just this past April, if you remember, it was published that science has discovered that at the very moment of conception, a bright flash of life marks the incredible event. There is darkness in the womb, and there is then a flash of light. For Mary... There was darkness in her womb, and then there was the light. The light of the world had come. God stepped into our darkness and revealed himself. Imagine it. Try to get your mind around that. That which brought all things into existence by a mere utterance, the light of 10 trillion suns and the light of the candle on the Christmas tree, even the light of the phosphorus creatures of the deepest oceans, and all of the other lights that our eyes will ever behold, even for infinite number of days, these combined are not as bright as the light which had created them. That same light sparked in the womb of Mary. Kuruti and Gastri Akusa Numatos Agio. She was found with child through the Holy Spirit. The Christmas child had come. Who can believe such a thing? Who could have imagined it in times past? And who can grasp it now that it has happened? And yet the words testify to the event. The light has come in a form that we can experience, feel, interact with, and rely upon. In this light, there is no darkness, and thus there is no fear. This marvelous event is that which occurred on that cold December day in the land of Israel. We celebrate the 25th of December as the day of Christ's birth, and it is. It is just not the birth out of the womb, Rather, the Bible points to this date as the birth within the womb. And not without significance, this is the same time of year that the Jewish festival of lights, Hanukkah, is celebrated. At times, the two events occur on the same day, such as is the case this year. This is probably what occurred that year as well. 
the light of the world came into the world on that same festival of lights. This day is mentioned in the book of John, chapter 10 and verse 22, where it is known as the Feast of Dedication. It says, now it was the Feast of Dedication in Jerusalem, and it was winter. It got its name from the time of the Maccabees, when the temple which had been defiled was cleansed and restored to proper worship. And because of this great event, it was memorialized and held annually. A later tradition concerning a day's worth of oil lasting eight days is merely a fable which is recorded in the Talmud. But Flavius Josephus tells us the reason for the annual event, which predates the Talmud. He says, I suppose the reason was because this liberty beyond our hopes appeared to us, and that thence was the name given to that festival. The Jewish people had been given a liberty beyond their hopes, a light which shone for them that God still favored them. How much more then is the fulfillment of this marvelous picture to be found in the light which came to provide a liberty never before dreamed of? The true temple of God, pure and undefiled, was prepared in a human body. The defiled temple which had existed from the time of Adam was, once again, made acceptable to God and for his service. This then was to be a liberty not from human rule and oppression, but that of freedom from the spiritual forces which have waged war on humanity since its very beginning. This light stepped into his creation in order to restore all that had gone astray. Zechariah, the father of John the Baptist, prophesied over his own son concerning this light which would accomplish these marvelous things. He said, and you, child, speaking of John the Baptist, will be called the prophet of the highest, for you will go before the face of the Lord to prepare his ways, to give knowledge of salvation to his people by the remission of their sins. Through the tender mercy of our God, with which the day spring from on high has visited us, to give light to those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death, to guide our feet into the way of peace. The light was coming, and John would be there to proclaim that fact, preparing the way for Israel to meet the promised Messiah. And Zechariah's prophecy was one which was built upon the words of Isaiah, pronounced 700 years earlier. Here Isaiah wrote these words in chapter 9 of his book. Nevertheless, the gloom will not be upon her who is distressed, as when at first he lightly esteemed the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, and afterward more heavily oppressed her, by the way of the sea beyond the Jordan, in Galilee of the Gentiles, the people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in the land of the shadow of death, upon them a light has shined. You have multiplied the nation and increased its joy. They rejoice before you according to the joy of harvest, as men rejoice when they divide the spoil. For you have broken the yoke of his burden and the staff of his shoulder, the rod of his oppressor, as in the days of Midian. For every warrior sandal from the noisy battle and garments rolled in blood will be used for burning and fuel of fire. For unto us a child is born, and unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulder. And his name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. Upon the throne of David and over his kingdom, to order it and establish it with judgment and justice from that time forward, even forever, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. What a marvel occurred in the dark recesses of the virgin womb. The Deliverer had come to deliver. The light of the world had come as God's divine beacon to rescue man from himself. The Lord God Almighty had condescended to come and dwell among us. Hirite and gastri ekusa ekumatos akio. She was found with child through the Holy Spirit. Christmas had arrived. In the darkness I groped, darkness of the deepest night, looking for life that would last, but it could not be found. But they... <sighs> then came the most marvelous light, and it came with the heavenly chorus, a glorious sound. 
through the tender mercy of our God, with which the day spring from on high has visited us, there is now light on the path that we trod, the everlasting light of our Lord Jesus. Now there is a new hope for us, a hope eternal to those who sit in darkness and in death's shadow. There is salvation from hell's pit so infernal. There is from the lamp of God, Christ's eternal glow. Our second thought is darkness and light. The Christmas story fills our minds with wonderful pictures of days past. We revel in this time of year each year. We smell the pine. We rejoice in the food which fills our taste buds. The weather is returned to where it was just 12 months before. These things delight our minds with memories of days past when we smell the same smells, taste the same tastes, and feel the same cool chill upon our necks. It is a time to remember and a time to make up new memories. But it is a time that we should also reflect upon why we celebrate. In reality, and without the holiday for many, it is the bleakest time of the year. The nights are at their longest, painful cold has settled in, and the winter of our despair has come. Many don't survive the ordeal, and the true winter of eternity's darkness arrives to claim their weary soul. God chose this unfavorable time of gloom to give us the greatest hope of all. What manner of love is this that would impel him to do what he did? What is it about man that God takes notice of him? From our perspective, oh boy, the answer is easy. I'm me. This is my life. Just like the wolf whose leg is caught in a trap will chew that leg off in order to survive, we will do anything to survive and to just keep on living. It is the eternal dream of man to just keep on living. Novels are written about it. Movies are made about it. It is our desire to just keep on living. But if we try to look at things from God's perspective, man, that is hard to figure. What on earth is of value in that mass of organisms which are nothing but rebellious, self-consumed, and hopelessly arrogant beings? We walk around in the darkness looking for anything to fill our brief existence with pleasure, going from darkness to darkness. Maybe that's it, though. Maybe it's because we are in darkness that we choose the darkness. No, wait, that can't be it. Adam was surrounded by the light, and yet he chose the darkness. Only after making the choice did he want the light once again. He did want it. That must be it then. Without knowing one from the other, we can't know which we want. That must be why God allowed it all to happen, and then to step in and give us a choice as to which we would choose. Surely that is it. The light of the world came to show us a contrast. We can choose the light, or we can revel in the dark. The choice is ours. And sure enough, this is what the light himself said. In John chapter 3, while talking at night with Nicodemus, Jesus said to him, and thus to us, He who believes in him is not condemned, but he who does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And this is the condemnation, that light has come into the world, and men love darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. For everyone practicing evil hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his deeds should be exposed. But he who does the truth comes to the light, that his deeds may be clearly seen, that they have been done in God. The distinction can be seen. The choice must be made, and all will pursue one of only two paths, towards the light or remaining in darkness. This, then, is the reason for the Christmas story. It is the reason for the otherwise unimaginable thing which God has done. He has come to give us light if we will but just choose it. We are here today to worship the King of the universe, the manifestation of the unseen Father in human flesh, to behold the marvel of the light which shines forth for us and which came to us in the most astonishing way of all. Curite in gastri accusa ec numatos agio. She was found with child through the Holy Spirit. God created all things out of nothing. He created something separate from himself and yet which is contained within his omnipresence and then he joined together with that which he created, all for the sake of frail, fallible, rebellious beings who otherwise had no hope at all. 
In that stupendously marvelous act, he has given us a choice. We can continue on in the darkness or we can come to the light. There is no tunnel of light for us to choose after death. I'm sorry, it doesn't work that way. There is only continued darkness which will span eternal ages. But there is a light which we can come to now. And in so doing, we are surrounded with light which will never end. No, nor never fade. God did this thing for us, for you. The perfection of Jesus Christ is seen from his moment of conception, through his birth in a lowly manger, in each step he ever took, and in each word he ever spoke. The perfection of Jesus Christ is seen in his torturous death on a wooden cross, and it is seen in the resurrection which came just days later. The child in the womb, the baby in the manger, the teacher on the mountain, the lifeless body on the cross, and the man standing victorious over death itself all speak of a wisdom and a love which spans the eons of time and the length and the breadth of the universe. All things make sense when we ponder what God has done and which started in the sudden flash of light in the womb of Mary. Kirite in gastri ekusa ek numatos agio. She was found with child through the Holy Spirit. Praise God for Jesus Christ, our Lord. Praise God for his infinite love poured out on us through Jesus Christ, our Lord. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. Our closing verse today comes from 1 John chapter 1, verse 1 through 4. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon and our hands have handled concerning the word of life, the life was manifested and we have seen and bear witness and declare to you that eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested to us. That which we have seen and heard, we declare to you that you also may have fellowship with us. And truly, our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And these things we write to you that your joy may be full. Next week is Exodus 40, 1 through 16, Paths and Lights and Even Lambs. It's entitled, Seven I Ams. That's our 104th Exodus sermon. And I told you when I typed that 10 weeks ago that there's a pattern in there which is really marvelous. And I didn't know it until I was halfway through the sermon and I had to knock myself on the head and say, what an idiot to miss this. It's marvelous. Our poem today is called The Light of the World. Now the birth of Jesus Christ was as follows. After the betrothal of his mother Mary had come around, before they came together, she was with the child of the Holy Spirit found. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man, righteousness he did display, and not wanting to make her a public example, was minded to put her secretly away. But while he thought about these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, and this he did say, his spoken word, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take to you Mary, your wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit the divine spark of life. And she will bring forth a son and you shall call his name Jesus for he will save his people from their sins. He is God's Christmas child, holy and marvelous. And you, Bethlehem Ephrata, I know that you agree. You are little among the thousands of Judah. It is so. Yet out of you shall come forth even unto me, the one to be ruler in Israel. My word is true, you know. His goings forth are from of old, from everlasting, thus you have been told. Nevertheless, the gloom will not be upon her who is distressed or in agony, as when at first he lightly esteemed the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, and afterward more heavily oppressed her by the way of the sea. Beyond the Jordan it shall occur in an area of the Gentiles, around the land of Galilee. The people who walked in darkness, it is they who have seen a great light, those who dwelt in the land of the shadow of death, upon them has shined a light so bright. You have multiplied the nation, and likewise its joy you have increased. They rejoice before you with great ovation, according to the time of harvest, a joy which will not be ceased. As men rejoice when they divide the spoil, when they receive the bounty and no longer toil. For you have the yoke of his burden broken, and the staff of his shoulder is taken away. 
the rod of his oppressor no longer an unfriendly token, as in the time of Midian when he was destroyed that day. For every warrior's sandal from the noisy battle and garments rolled in blood will be used for burning and fuel of fire, worthless chattel, useless implements overtaken by time's great flood. Praise God, O Israel, for unto us a child is born. Praise the Lord, land of Judah, for unto us a son is given, and the government shall upon his shoulder be worn, and through him shall man's sins be forgiven, and his name will be called Wonderful, the Counselor and Mighty God is he, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace, pure and white as wool, of the increase of his government and peace no end shall we see. Upon the throne of David and over his kingdom's realm, to order it and establish it with judgment and justice. From that time forward, even forever, he at the helm, the zeal of the Lord of hosts, will perform this. The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet, until Shiloh comes and we shout, Hallelujah! And to him the obedience of the people shall be sweet. This helpless baby, lying in a manger, will rule the world in everlasting peace. Through him will come surety with no danger, and the rule of his glory shall never, never cease. All praise to our stupendous Lord of glory. Yes, all honor to this precious King, praising God for the wondrous Christmas story. Let all the Lord's redeemed shout aloud and sing, hallelujah and amen. It's wonderful to be here today in the presence of the saints, Lord and to worship the King who came to redeem us from our sin. It sure is wonderful. We commit the Lord's table to you, Lord God. Amen. We get the words for the Lord's Supper directly from the Bible, from the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 11, where Paul wrote these words concerning what Christ did for us. He said, For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that on the same night in which he was betrayed, he took bread. And he would have given thanks over that bread. He would have said these words, Baruch ata Adonai Eloheinu, Melech haolam hamotzi lechem min haaretz. Blessed art thou, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who brings forth bread from the earth. And he broke it. And he said, Take and eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he took the cup after supper, and he would have blessed this as well. He would have said, Baruch Ata Adonai Eloheinu, Melech HaOlam, Borei Pari HaGapen. Blessed art thou, O Lord our God, King of the universe, creator of the fruit of the vine. This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Therefore, whoever eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner eats and drinks judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. Sin. Our sin necessitated that innocent baby to go to the cross of Calvary. And that's why we take the Lord's Supper each week, is to remember his death until he comes. He who had done no wrong was made sin for us so that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. The body and the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ.
Sergio and Rhoda, the body and the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Brother Steve, and the body and the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Hi, Precious. How are you today? The body and the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. I sigh. The body and the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Pat, the body and the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul and Elaine, the body and the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Doctor and Mabel, the body and the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Joan, Jay, the body and the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. You sure one? <laughs> now we got enough. Oh, maybe not. Burke walked in, that's right. But we'll see. We'll see. <laughs> Kyle, the body and the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. <coughs> Brother Burke, the body and the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Vic, the body and the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. And dead, the body and the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Glory to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Ghost. As it was in the beginning, is now and will be forever, world without end. Amen. 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 Heavenly Father, one other prayer that we did not lift up earlier, and I'd like to pray for my mom who's got terrible bronchitis and who's just been really out of it the past couple of days. I'd add her into those prayers, and I'd pray that you would get Paul and Elaine safely up halfway to uh, Virginia today and uh, take care of them the rest of the way tomorrow, and that they would arrive safely and have a good time while they're up there, and we'll miss their presence. And Lord, I thank you for each person that's here and is a part of this ministry and that helps it to survive, each person online, each person that attends from even the farthest parts of the world, that my friend in Manila who attends with us. And I'm so thankful for all of these people, all, all that help keep us open in this little church. Great things you have done, oh God. And we commit the year ahead to you. Can't wait for the New Year celebration next year and the anticipation of great things ahead in the year 2017 maybe it'll be the year when you come for us no matter what that is no matter when we will be patient we will wait quietly for you we love you lord jesus we praise you we exalt you amen, amen.